as I say, I don't need the mic for this small room for the purposes of the uh, the online viewers. Uh, Alexandra Mattioli of Shape Blue and new networking capabilities in CloudStack. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Steve. So we'll be talking about some new network capabilities, CloudStack, and how you can use for VNF deployments and other kinds of deployments and how to empower users. That's really a key point here. Uh, for the audience here, sorry if I give my back to you, just the shape of the room is a bit strange. So, uh, work for Shea Blue from Brazil, now based in Prague, work in IT for some 30 years, CloudStack for about 10, built some really big solutions on top of CloudStack, cloud with 17 zones all around the world, three regions. Um, and we'll talk about VNFs, lots about VNFs. So I'm going to give a quick introduction, which is a bit of a repeat of my talk last year, but very shortened version. Uh, won't take too long. Uh, talk about some challenges ahead, some improvements on those features, how things are better, then some still some challenges, some new features, and then future features and ideas. And there are two related talks. There's Vase talk on outscaling and Abshax talk on edge zones. I worked with them on both of those and they'll be amazing, I'm sure. So what's a VNF? Is just simply a network function running as a VM. We all use VNFs all the time. And they went through the same journey as any other function, from big dedicated hardware to commodity hardware to VMs. Just was a bit different as it networking really depended a lot on ASICs, very specialized hardware that had a 10 year development cycle, very slow. With VNFs, that development cycle is much quicker and much easier to do a proof of concept. Instead of getting a half million dollar Juniper router, you get an ISO and just deploy. So that's a established framework for VNFs. That's the NFV fr framework, the network function virtualization, which is the principle which VNFs are a part of. And it has the management plane, the hypervisor, the VNFs themselves, and all the services on top of it. And we can map that to CloudStack. The CloudStack Vita router is just a VNF. And we probably should call it CloudStack VNF, because as everyone knows, in many cases, it's not really routing. So it's a bit of a misnomer. So the challenges that uh, myself and others had back then around CloudStack 4.9, it wasn't really VNF ready. VNFs came with templates with multiple disks, uh, settings that you had to enter at deployment time, specialized features of hypervisors, like passing PVLANs or promiscuous mode. It was really the network service providers of networking features trying to adapt what the vendors trying to adapt what they had in hardware to the virtual world. And it wasn't really ready yet, and CloudStack wasn't ready for all these different things. And led to connectivity, service chaining, which is really key nowadays. So for those who don't know, service chaining is simply when you pass one at a function to another at a function to another, and I've built solutions in the past that had service chaining seven deep with all kinds of IPS IDS, firewalls. In this case, you can pass through firewall, then a SSL endpoint, then load balance, then go to your SD1 mesh. What happened between 4.9 and 4.16? Some of these features were driven by myself, others by the community. Lots of interesting features. PVLANs, VLAN trunking, layer 2 networks, 
all of those really made it much easier to deploy VNFs. But it's still, um, some challenges remained. It was not all there yet. So last year, CCC 2021, I presented some ideas that would make it easier to deploy VNFs. That was one of them. It wasn't really like this, as we couldn't be all in person. Uh, present the idea of a rooted dual stack uh, VPC and well, cloud stack VR in general, which was implemented by uh, Wade Zoom. And there's a great presentation by Abshek on that that explains in detail. So I'm not going to really go in detail how that was implemented. But now, as of 417, we can use IPv6 fully rooted down to the VM. IPv4 is still not, that's a, still a challenge that we need to work on. Another idea that I had, well, the conference was more like this, everyone at home. Um, another idea that I presented was for end users to be able to deploy their own VLANs, manage their own VLANs. How exactly is something that we discussed a lot and came up with some ideas and that has uh, already been implemented and I'll go in more depth on this solution and use cases. So to enable that, we have a new concept in CloudStack that associated networks, which is about empowering the end user while cutting overheads for the operator. So we have their mic, which is our, uh, probably most of you know, and represents the power. So that's how it looks when you create a network offering. On um, shared networks, previously you couldn't specify VLAN. Now you can. And uh, end user, just a normal user, can deploy a shared network and associate it to other networks. One of the design decisions was to allow to associate your network to basically any other kind of isolated layer two network in CloudStack just to drive more. So basically that CloudStack isolated network will have just one virtual machine, in this case, DVNF. Next step, we create a layer two network. This layer two network will not be directly used. That's a way we found to, as a proxy, to the user selecting a VLAN. We had ideas about how users could have their own VLANs and manage them, and that added a bit too much complexity. So this way, you can just use a layer two network as a proxy of that. So there, the end user is creating a user share network and associating that to the layer two network. So what happens there, that layer two network has been deployed in a VLAN or VXLAN in some layer two broadcast domain. And this share network is created on that same broadcast domain. So from now on, we can pretty much forget the layer two network and think just about the shared. Sorry, moved accidentally. So from now on, I'll refer to that layer two network just as VLAN A. Let's forget that the layer two network exists. So there we have a solution top to bottom with your VM traffic passing through a VNF and out through the isolated network. And you have the CloudStack VR, which I purposefully did not use the router symbol because it doesn't really act as a VR. Just DCP DNS has lots of good features, but not routing. Apologies, it went backwards. And there, in this case, you have your VM passing through the user share network through your VNF 
that static net and out to your SD1 mesh that can then connect to all your other sites being other clouds, uh, remote offices, corporate, anywhere. So that in that case, we had just one VNF. But we talked before about service chaining. So let's see how an uh, end user can chain services. So we go through the same steps that we did before. Create an isolated network, deploy the VNF VM, static NAT, just one to one, create a layer network just as a proxy for a VLAN selection. Deploy your VNF. In that case, we are deploying a firewall. So this is skipped a couple steps. My apologies. So up to here is the same. We deployed one VNF. Then we create another layer two network and deploy another VNF. So there we have a service chain with a firewall and a SD1 device. Then another layer two network downstream from the firewall and then that one gets associated with a shared network deployed by the end user. And there we have this full solution where the end user VMs go through that firewall, then the SD1, and out to SD1 mesh or the internet or enterprise network. And all of this was without any operator intervention. Sorry, this is moving by itself. <laughs> That's really a key point. That's it really cuts overhead. In the past, to create anything like this, it was possible. But you have to raise a ticket for the operator to go and create your shared network. Lots of overhead. And how do you automate that? It's possible. I've seen people automate sending an email to support of the operator to create something. But yeah, that's not really very cloud solution, right? In this case, we have that one-to-one -one at, which is, it can cause some issues, is not ideal, but with IPv6, we don't need that NAT. We still have firewall on the isolated network, but the solution is fully routed all the way down. And for more information on how IPv6 was implemented, so just watching Abhishek's presentation. This another solution. What if your end users still want to use IPv4? One of your VNFs can be a 6 to 4 gateway of any kind. You basically can place in your chain any network services. And that 6 to 4 can be chained with other. Can, you can have upstream uh, SD1 device or be the other way around, depending on requirements completely. So this is another use case for these associated networks. This is how typically a private gateway was created. You would have to Again, raise a ticket, ask your operator to create a private gateway in a certain VLAN, and yeah, more operation overhead. And users, they just couldn't create themselves. Of course, they cannot select directly a VLAN. So this was one way to do it, and the way that the end user could do by themselves would be with IPsec on top of the VPC. <coughs> which works, but is not super scalable. When you have more than a few sites, then creating all the tunnels, creating a mesh, it does become a nightmare, and it can sometimes not be 
the most stable or bandwidth friendly solution and also yeah resource intensive on the VR. So another way you can do that now with user share networks is going basically through the same steps. There we have two VPCs in the same zone. So they have layer two. And we go basically through the same steps as before. Create a layer two network that will be used just as a link between those two VPCs. Then on your left VPC, you create a gateway, a private gateway, associated to that layer two network. So that gateway you go on the same VLAN as that layer two network. Same thing on the right side PV VPC, connecting to the same layer two network. Uh, and the user, in this case, doesn't need to know any VLAN numbers or have any privileged access. You create your static routes on both sides so they can talk. And you have this final solution where those database servers, for example, can just replicate between those two VPCs. And that, again, was done completely without any operator intervention, just a normal end user. And you can build much more complex topologies. You can, their service chain, a VNF out of your private gateway. So you associate your private gateway to that layer two network, deploy a VNF in your layer two network, and have the upstream interface of the VNF connected to isolated network, again with a static NAT, and out to your uh, S dual mesh or to internet or any other networks. So that's basically the concept of associated networks. It's available in FOS 17, it's implemented in two features. Uh, user shared networks and on user driven private gateways. It enables much richer topologies in cloud stack and reduces lots of the overhead. So no need to go and ask your operator to do this and that and then they don't understand what they really want and go back and forth. So it's a great advantage for the end user and for the cloud operator. And in my experience, the more you enable your end user to create their own topologies, the more creative they get, the more they consume your cloud as well. <coughs> Excuse me. This also raises a few issues. Probably some of you are already thinking, okay, uh, you're chaining several services. What about things like MTU? What about how do I route this? We'll go through all of that. So there are a few features that are being worked on to address these new challenges and some which are also improvements on all of this to make network topologies even more flexible in cloud stack. So first, let's talk about fixing those problems. First one, programmable MTU. So that's something that's being worked on, where initially you can set the MTU on the public and the private interfaces of the virtual router. So those are new fields that the end user can select. Of course, you don't want your end user using MTUs that are not supported by your infrastructure. So there are global end zone level settings to 
set the maximum MTU. If you support 9000 MTU all the way, you can just set that to 9000 in the zone. And your end user yep, can also use that for higher MTUs, not just for lower. If they use, want to use jumbo frames, they can do that. But in the use case of VNFs, that really is typically lower than 1500 bytes. And there is a virtual router with the downstream interface, still 1500 MTU, the upstream 1440. And there, yeah, a very realistic depiction of how your frame gets smaller when it passes through the virtual router. Another uh, feature that we are working on is the configurable protocol options in FIRO rules. Right now, the isolated network FIRO rules are very limited. Just TCP, UDP, and ICMP. And another sticking point there is that it's very different from what you can do with a VPC. A VPC, you have much richer protocol options. So that's something that is being worked on to bring those two together to enable more protocol options in the isolated networks and make a bit more user-friendly the VPC. That's quite clunky the way it is. So that is a little bit of a barrier for end users to use those firewall rules in VPCs. Another uh, enhancement and problem solving that we're working on is not totally uh, directly related to VNFs, but also applicable, which is to enable to configure your source NAT IP. So currently, you create an isolated network. It acquires an IP. That first IP is your source NAT IP, and you cannot change that. You're stuck with that. And for some reason, you might want to change that. Or an uh, example that I personally had, had a slash 24 public IPs presented to CloudStack, and that had to be de decommissioned. So 200 IPs being used, it was a nightmare. It took over a year to remove all those networks. And with that, you can just change your source NAT IP. You just make another IP your source NAT. Exactly how it works in details, that's something that we're still working on. And now let's talk about some enhancements that we can build on top of what we have seen. The first one that we're looking at, policy-based routing, which has been a standard feature in routers for a long time, where you route not only based on the destination, but also on the source IPs, port number, packet size. I've seen policy-based routing that even took the time of day into account. There are all kinds of things that you can use to decide which path the packets should take. So in this case, we have the web tier going straight out through the VPC virtual router and out to the internet, while the application tier goes through the private gateway, through AVNF, and out through that isolated network. And those two networks can be in separate physical networks and be in completely uh, separate IP transit providers. There are many use cases for that and for routing on any of these and many more options. Another thing that probably everyone thinking after presenting anything about rooted IPv6 is what about IPv4? It's not there yet, 
currently we have just IPv6, but thinking we're thinking on how to do IPv4. So ideally we have dual stack fully routed all the way to the VMs. But there are some challenges. IPv6 is quite easy. Address space is gigantic. And you can just present I slash 64 to which network, not a problem. IPv4, how do we break those networks in a way that we don't waste too many IPs? There's a challenge that still thinking about how to do that in a way that can still be consumed in an economic way. And the big elephant in the room in cloud stack for a long time has been dynamic routing. It's something that has been talked about in the community for a long, long time. Many discussions, many suggestions, different ways how to do that. But, but no real conclusion. So one of the things that happened with discussions of dynamic routing was that it was preventing uh, CloudStack support for IPv6. Because every time talk IPv6, started discussing dynamic routing and then would get stuck that. So in the end, we pushed it to, OK, let's get IPv6 out there, statically routed. Then providers can start using IPv6. When you set up your networks, you still need to add static routes back to the slash 64s. But you can use it. It's out there. So once you see how that's adopted, how that's used, and then gather ideas. But this is something that, yeah, we all want it. We all need this. There are many, many ideas on how to do it. And we need to yeah, talk <laughs> about how to do it. And that's another big next step for CloudStack that I'll not go into details, which is how to take CloudStack to the edge, to the edge of network. And Abhishek will be giving a talk about that in a few hours, and the video will be available. Questions on this? <coughs> Any questions for uh, Alex? There's nothing on the online there, uh, Alex. Why, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I have a question about the configurable uh, source net IP. Yes. So can we make uh, another good. public IP in different IP range as the source net IP, as the new source net IP? So. Yes. So yeah. from a different, from a completely different villain? Yes. Yeah, that's part of the feature. So will it be some downtime during the switch? Oh, yes, absolutely. There will be some downtime. OK, thank you, Alex. But the downtime will be much, much smaller than what the downtime is now. Right now, you need to crypt, add a new network to your VM, change quite a lot of things. So with this, yeah, a little bit of downtime, but much less. You already said that. Uh, there is no yet routing for IPv4, but is it uh, possible to have a IPv4 address on the uh, VNF without one-to-one -one NAT? Is there such an option? Okay, let's get back to the diagram. You mean here? Uh, for, no, for, before, uh, for the routed 
rooted before. Um, sorry, where? Yeah. Okay. So can we have, can we have here a uh, public IP on the VNF without this one-to-one -one NAT? At the moment, no. It's still a static NAT. Yeah, okay, thanks. And you have the limitations of the firewall rules. You can also create this with a one-tier VPC, but then you have the problem of not being that user-friendly and other shortcomings VPC. Thank you. Jeff? So uh, to answer your question, um, uh, there is a way, but it's not via cloud stack. So what this is a use case we have faced. So we create an L2, uh, but give it the public IP and block it in the, now there's an API to reserve it also. So that's how we do it. Because in some countries, IPv4 is very costly. Right? Yeah, so that, that was a big driving factor for pushing to have yes. some kind of IPv6. Yes. Right now, yeah, it's statically rooted. But CloudStack, uh, when you add IPv6 to your network, it tells you which static route needs to be added to your router. So you can automate that out of cloud, outside of CloudStack yes. and yeah. add. Which was always a big challenge going back to all these steps of adding a VNF. So let's just look at this how was before users could select their own VLANs using a layer two as a proxy for that. At this point of interaction, you needed to raise a ticket to your operator to create that shared network, give details of the network, this and that, and yeah, huge overhead there. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question from the uh, online audience, Alex. Um, any from Koshi Kabora? Uh, any plans to include VXLAN in VPC network? I don't know the answer to that. Okay, perhaps yeah. something you can look into and... Uh, definitely, definitely, yeah. Great, That's thank you very much. Yeah. Um, any more questions from the room? Okay, thank you, Alex, very much.